But one of the things we have to look at when we look at the Aramco number, it's a huge headline number. But when we drill down, we see the taxation rates, the royalty rates on a per barrel basis, the number is not so big. When you look at it, it's compared to like a total or a shell. It's actually on a per barrel basis, a little bit lower. Okay, so what they're making per barrel is less than some of those, but you got to admit, it's that, a huge that number. headline number is stunning. Yeah, it's a huge number. It reflects the fact that they have a massive resource base. They are truly the world's low cost producer, very low levels of debt. And Aramco has always been saying, you know, wait till we reveal the numbers. And it was a big reveal yesterday. It, it was, and we got it because of their bond sale, not because of an IPO. Do you think this, and I know you're not a, an equity analyst on Aramco, but does it kind of give the Saudis a little bit of swagger of if they ever take does. the company public? We I, told you our numbers were big. Right. I mean, the question is, will they ever take the company public? Well, I mean, they've been talk, waiting for three years. Right, and so they we... talk about the deadline is 2021. I mean, I think it's interesting that they are doing this bond sale because it's to acquire the petrochemical company Sabic and give more money to the public investment fund to basically make investments. Did they have to tap the bond markets? They say they didn't have to do that. So the question is, like, are they doing this in terms of preparation for an IPO? We just have to wait. And well, see. here's the problem: their cost per barrel is somewhere people think around three dollars, right? Yeah. Three to five is what they right. what they spend. But yet their budget requires, what, 88 a barrel to pay for right. their social and that's programs? that's exactly what the issue and the prospectus is. I mean, Aramco is the cash cow for the Saudi state. And so they really do rely on Aramco to fund a very expansive foreign policy, you know, very generous still domestic benefits for their population. And so that is the real issue with Aramco, is what does it fund? It funds the entire Saudi state. The, but still, the numbers are very impressive. They're amazing. They're amazing. Right? Numbers. amazing. JP Morgan, Google, Facebook, and ExxonMobil combined. Okay, the best performing commodity in the world is the one we're going to show after this segment. That was our mystery chart. It's not oil. Oil is the second best. You and I, of course, we were in OPEC together many times, by the way, in the last yes. few years. It appears OPEC's strategy is working. Oil I up 34%. I would say it's the Saudi strategy that's working. So I feel like Saudi can take a win on two A lot issues. of love for Saudi Arabia Well, I will tell you, I would give it to Khalid Afala. I mean, he, the Saudi oil minister, he kept saying in December, look what we do in Q1. You know, you have some questions about our credibility with this cut. The Saudis have been very, very relentless in driving down exports to the United States. So they've cut overall production. But if you look at the Motiva refinery, which they own, biggest they, in America, they've basically zeroed out basically Saudi exports to that refinery to change the sort of outlook of U.S. inventory data. So they've been incredibly disciplined in basically their strategy of getting prices higher. And no Venezuela, a zero Venezuela right? coming well, to the United well, States. Exactly. Like there, was one, there was one tanker about three weeks ago that we highlighted, and that's it. I mean, Sitgo is not taking any Venezuelan barrels, and Motiva is not taking any Saudi barrels at this point. It's basically. all coming from the Permian, effectively. Well, what's really interesting, though, is we are now short, though, heavy barrels into the United States, because the Permian barrel is a light barrel. Yeah, the type and, of crude oil right, that is. Right, so we basically have, you know, the heavy barrel from Venezuela not coming, so we have to source that from other places, and the Saudis won't give it to us. Hence why I expect more Donald Trump tweets. Well, you know, every time oil gets around 55 or 60, he sends out a tweet. I know, so expect more of this. Well, but the Saudis have been sending those to voicemail, so they've not been <laughs> taking a call. I love that. Is it going to, uh, so you're saying it's not going to work? Well, I think that's. Because apparently it worked the last time. Well, the thing is, the Saudis thought, and a lot of people believe, that there would be no exemptions granted for Iran, and they gave eight. So they're basically saying to President Trump, let's see what you do on Iran in May. Yeah, I mean, I love that, sending it to voicemail, because who checks voicemail at all anymore? Do you expect oil to continue its climb higher, Halima? I mean, there are a couple things I really want to watch. What does happen with Venezuela? Are there secondary sanctions imposed? Do we essentially say to India, to China, you can't take any Venezuelan barrels either? Can we say that? Look what we did with Iran. I mean, we actually, I mean, China has basically halved their Iranian imports. And if you look at India's made major reductions, if we say to Reliance, you can access the U.S. capital markets or you can take Venezuelan barrels, I think they'll leave the Venezuelan barrels on the sidelines. Yeah, and by the way, we, we did grant a bunch of exemptions for we, Iranian we, oil. We granted eight, but now three countries have gone to zero. So we basically have about five receiving exemptions. I think that will probably be a couple more will be zeroed out by the time the decision comes in May. Halima. So a couple hundred thousand more Iranian barrels off the market. Yeah, Halima Croft of RBC Steel. Whatever their cost per barrel and whatever they make per barrel, those are big. Big numbers. Man. It's a good week for Saudi.